All right. So if you could start by just telling us your name and school and school district. Uh, my name is Steve Donkin, that's D-O-N-K-I-N. I teach at uh, Cardozo Education Campus. It's a middle school and a high school. I teach in the high school in uh, Washington, D.C. I'm a member of the Washington Teachers Union. Um, I'm the building rep for our union at our school. I'm also on the uh, executive board, one of the of the union, uh, one of the at large uh, members, uh, representatives uh, of high schools. Great, thank you. And could you just tell us before we we jump into the COVID stuff, tell us a little bit more about your your school community demographics. Uh, just anything you, that we should know about your where in the district, which quadrant is it is it in? Okay. Well, we are we are a very historic uh, school. We're we're known as the Castle on the Hill because we're uh, located, uh, you know, just above U Street, uh, just below Columbia Heights uh, on a hill, a um, few blocks north of U Street. Uh, and our school is a Title One school. Um, our population we've got about. I think this year we had about 800 students. Um, uh, it's about evenly split, uh, maybe slightly more uh, what we call the, the general ed or mainstream students, uh, um, mostly African American, um, but not entirely. The other half is, is our, um, we have an international academy, which is actually where I teach. Uh, that's we're one of three international academies in DC. Um, and uh, that's specifically for immigrant students, uh, newcomers, English language learners. Um, and that population, you know, is mostly Spanish speakers from Central America, um, some from Mexico, but also some, you know, from various countries in Africa, in Asia, um, fairly diverse. Uh, and then our, our middle school as well is about, uh, I think it's a couple hundred, I think, um, maybe a little less than that. And also we have, we have, even though we have an international academy, which is exclusively English language learners, we also have uh, students in the general population who qualify, who would be called English language learners, even though um, their, their proficiency is, is higher, so they're not specific to the uh, International Academy. Got it. Thank you so much. Um, and we're, we're going to just kind of take it to, to the COVID. When was it, or maybe not even when, but what do you recall about when it hit you that this was going to be something that really impacted your school and DCPS as a, as a whole? <laughs> um, well, I remember when it first came out in the news back in January and in February, actually a friend of ours uh, who worked in the government had, had kind of warned us, you know, this is going to be big. You know, you all need to be prepared. There may be some lockdowns coming up. You need to stock up on all your provisions. And we were like, oh, okay, well, you know, we'll, we can do that, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. It was in... March, uh, early March, when uh, there was a story about uh, a case at School Without Walls, um, where they actually sh shut down the building for one day. Uh, one of my colleagues at Cardozo, his wife teaches there, uh, so he was telling me about it. They supposedly went in and did, did a deep clean for one day, and that's when a lot of us started thinking, oh, this, this is starting to get close to home. Um, and uh, yeah, it kind of was shortly after that, it was the 13th of March, I believe, when it was announced that um, it was a Friday that students would be going home and they wouldn't be coming back next week. And that's, that's when the, the shutdown began. Yeah, and so when, that this transition to online for the rest of the school year, how did that work, especially for, for school? 
interesting. You mentioned that it's a Title I school. So was internet access an issue, device act issue for students? And, and how did that work for the, the rest of the, the school? Yeah, it was uh, very challenging. Um, a lot of us were unhappy with the way it was rolled out. So suddenly with very little preparation, uh, no time for us or the students to prepare. And yes, technology uh, was an issue. A lot of our students uh, don't have access uh, to technology at home. Uh, they don't have the Wi-Fi uh, capabilities. Um, and it was a few weeks after we shut down that finally we got it together and started handing out laptops to and hotspots uh, to the students who needed it. Um, you know, we identified students with a need and they had to come into school and pick those up. Um, but that was very frustrating because, you know, the DC is kind of in, in the process of what has been in the process of moving towards a one-to-one -one, um, device to student um, situation. And we were, hadn't come close to that yet. And supposedly there were a lot of laptops uh, in a warehouse that we had to really fight with DCPS to get them to release them and just get them out in the hands of students because time was going by and students were unable to access anything online. Uh, so yeah, it was, it, like I said, it was, I would say, try to be kind when I say it was very frustrating and challenging for us. So, yeah. <laughs> and at last, um, is there any memorable experience you had a particular student or another co-worker um, that comes to mind as, as this virtual learning rolled out or, or just, uh, you know, one thing that I'm hearing from teachers is it's a lot of just non-academic stuff was these memorable moments that they had with um, mm -hmm. in their lives. Just curious, something that comes to mind for you. Yeah, I mean, I can think of several. I mean, actually, it was just a few weeks after we closed down the schools that uh, I heard of the first um, case of one of my students, uh, her mother had, had contracted it and actually died from it. So, you know, and then other other cases, I heard of students getting it. Um, so that was very troubling. Um, we especially towards the end of the year as we were struggling a lot, you know, a number of my students are seniors who were really counting on graduating and just struggling with getting them to get what they needed done to graduate. Uh, had some very exhausting, but in the end rewarding because we made it uh, sessions <laughs> working with seniors who were having, a, you know, up until the end technical problems connectivity problems, trying, trying to get all their work done uh, so they could pass their classes and graduate. Uh, so that was very, like I said, that was very exhausting, but we, we got through that. And so it was, you know, a happy ending. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And how, how did graduation work for you all? Was there a virtual component? Was there some type of a any type of like a, a, a car caravan or anything? How did, how did you all handle the, the graduation this year? Yeah, I would, I would give a lot of credit to our, our principal and his uh, admin team on that and some other folks, a lot of other folks that worked on it. We, I think under the circumstances, they got a really good send off. Um, the seniors um, had a, uh, we had a virtual senior send off uh, about, a, I guess, a week or so before the official graduation. It was a video, you know, put together a video program, um, all the teachers uh, giving their best wishes on and all that. So a lot of people showed up for that. Um, there was a team uh, of folks that actually went out and did delivery of the graduation gowns and, and all the graduation materials that they would normally have gotten in school, uh, took them to their houses, to where they lived, and got some great videos of very happy students receiving their gowns and trying them on and showing them off. And then the actual uh, graduation, you know, again, was virtual. 
uh, really, really great production job. Um, uh, almost, I almost cried watching it. It was <laughs> really, uh, really, really well done. So I thought, I thought they did very good on that. That's great. And before I get to my, my last question, which is kind of the big one about reopening, um, one other question I, I just have is with your, your students, some of them obviously mentioning the, the, the student who's, whose parent passed away, that's a really traumatic um, impact that COVID had. But how, how did other students, how, how did your students as a whole kind of cope with, with everything that was going on? I'm sure it came up in, in different ways in, in your classes. I'm just curious as to how the, the kids reacted to everything as it was happening. Yeah, it was, you know, it's just amazing how, I mean, obviously it's, it affects students uh, as it does adults, but, you know, students, especially at a young age. Uh, so, you know, I don't want to underplay that, um, but I was also amazed at the resiliency of a lot of our students. Um, they just kind of hunkered down and did what they needed to do. And, you know, we had virtual online classes as well and you know a good number of them showed up regularly not of course all of them um but you know always checking in on them you know how you doing how's everything in, at home how's your family doing anything you need all that and they were you know they they were taking it you know very well very like i said very resilient and i think you know i think a lot of it our students our population of students, I mean, they're used to, you know, putting up with a lot. I mean, they do on a, on a regular basis in their lives. Our, our international students, you know, what they went through to actually just get to this country and what they were leaving, what they were, you know, trying to get away from back in their home countries. Uh, th there's a lot of trauma there. And that's something we're always dealing with. And the students, you know, our native born students, our DC students, obviously the same thing. You know, issues of poverty, uh, you know, uh, unstable housing situations, family, family problems. Um, so, yeah, you, you, I was very impressed at how, how resilient they are, but I always, always worried still, you know, what's, what's really going on, you know, and it's, it's a very difficult difficult situation. Definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, so I, I guess that does take us to this last question, which is a month from now, I think what August 24th is the slated day for first day of school. Uh, what do you think needs to happen for, for schools to reopen in person? And how do you think that uh, the fall should go? If, if you were in charge, what, what would you do? Uh, to to, to um, uh, bring in in the fall. Yeah, August thirty first is uh, the first day for students, uh, and um, uh, I think a lot of what we've seen this summer in terms of the rollout of the plans or the non rollout of the plans, because we still don't, they still haven't told us definitely yet. Uh, is that yeah, you know, you said if I was in charge, you know, yeah actually educators should be in charge of our school system. Unfortunately, that's not the case now. We have a mayor, you know, a politician, and we've got a chancellor and other bureaucrats who really, again, I'm trying to be kind, but they don't know what's going on in the schools. They don't, they're not there every day. Um, and they don't listen to us. That's been a big problem is there's been almost no collaboration with, with educators. Uh, they tell us, okay, this is what we're gonna do. And, you know, that's, that's it. Uh, this is our plan now, or this is, or we'll tell you our plan when we're, re we're ready. That's where we're at now. Um, but it, what I think should happen is, and I'm, I'm speaking, you know, I talk to a lot of other teachers as well. So I'm, this is not just me. It's 100% virtual learning, we, you know, we're not, you know, starting in the fall, we're not ready. We're, uh, actually, the health indicators in DC are not encouraging, why is, which is why the mayor delayed an announcement she was supposed to make last week, and she's supposed to make it now at the end of July. Um, and, 
you know, knowing, knowing what goes on in our schools, we know that a lot of these so-called, uh, you know, um, procedures or plans or policies or whatever they think are going to, they're going to roll out, they just don't work. They don't work in a school setting. A school, a school is very different than any other workplace because you've got, you know, some adults in the building, but overwhelmingly it's a building full of children. And that's always a challenging uh, environment. I, um, I'm a science teacher. Um, so that's my thing. And actually I was, I did a lot of science research and, and other other type of things in the science field before I became a teacher some 20 years ago. Um, so I'm looking at the science. I've act, you know, I, I spent a lot of time this summer actually reviewing, you know, all the, all the technical literature that's out there, all the dull, boring papers and things that are being written about this. And the, the real conclusion is, you know, the, the, the science is saying is that we just know very little about this this virus. Um, we don't know, you know, how much is necessary, what dosage of virus is necessary to, for a person to even get sick. We don't know how it's transmitted. There's a lot of thoughts and ideas. It's probably transmitted through very tiny particles called aerosols, which are things that you give off when you speak or breathe normally. Uh, we're not even sure if uh, some of the PPEs that they talk about, like the masks, how they function in certain situations when people are coughing or sneezing, how, how, how effective are they? The social distancing, the, the six feet guidance policy from the CDC. This is amazing, I found out. It, it's based on, on a study that was done in the 1930s about you know, droplet emission from people and you know how how far it will travel before it goes to the goes to the ground. This was before they even had any means to measure the very tiny sub micrometer particles that we now think uh, COVID is transmitted by. Um, so there have been a lot of studies as, that suggest you know six feet is not adequate. So so there's a lot there's a lot of unknowns and. That this is not the, the kind of situation we need to be sending children and teachers into. So we all want to get back. We all want to get back to school. We want to be with our students. We, you know, we understand what everybody's saying about that, but we have to be safe first. Definitely. Yeah. So I guess that pretty much brings us to the end. It's a pretty short interview, but uh, I guess my last thing would just be, is there anything else you want to share or anything before I, I pause the recording? Uh, well, I just hope whoever, who's at, whoever is watching this, whoever is out there, just really understand that, you know, te you know like I said, I've worked with teachers for about 20 years now. And, you know, this is the most uh, exhausting but rewarding career I've ever had. And teachers, teachers really, really do care. I mean, we're in this because we want to, you know, make a difference in pe young people's lives. We want to help, help them with their education. Uh, so there's, there's really not a more selfless group of people that I've ever worked with. And so when we say we don't want to go back in the buildings, it's not, you know, we're not trying to, you know, avoid doing our jobs or thinking only of ourselves. It's really a very selfless um, position that we're taking because we care, you know, first and foremost, we work for the children. For me, I always say my boss is, is my students. That's who I work for. Nobody else, you know, that's, so that's my clientele. And so that's, you know, teachers are really, uh, looking out for the best, what's best for the, for the children, for the students. And I just hope everybody really understands uh, that, uh, that we're really sincere when we, when we say that. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm going to pause.